certainly an honor uh, to be on this panel. I know we've done a lot of shows together, myself and Ambassador Bissett. I've uh, done a few shows all on my own, so it's going to be difficult to try to compress what we normally try to expand to fill an evening into just 15 minutes. We're going to change pace a little bit, and having certainly Joe McKenzie and Ambassador Bissett uh, lay the groundwork, all the technical terms, all the context, allows me a bit more latitude to get into uh, putting a little more personal face on uh, just what they've been telling you about the Balkans. Um, is there any way we can dim the front lights or, so it's clear? I normally don't use uh, photos and little tricks, but knowing that I had the, such an esteemed panel up here, I knew I had to go with some sort of extra trick to raise the bar. Um, my own uh, experience with the Balkans started back in 92. In fact, that's where I first met Joe McKenzie, way back in uh, Croatia. I uh, covered that uh, as our soldiers were there. And as the others that were here, I mean, certainly spoke out when Canada decided to join the bombing campaign in 1999, felt strongly enough about it that I went into Belgrade during the bombing, I spent 28 days there, and also ended up in Kosovo before NATO troops arrived. So having witnessed it and been listening to Jamie Shea, the NATO spokesperson on the air, um, talking about what was happening, how they were destroying the Serbian military, they destroyed the Serbian morale, uh, it was a shock to see soldiers like this coming out of Kosovo after the deal had been negotiated, and of course it didn't paint the same picture which the NATO accredited journalists that were sitting down and waiting to come in with the troops wanted to see. There was only about a hundred and something of us that were NATO or Serbian accredited that were in Kosovo, uh, as opposed to I think it was 1,200 um, NATO journalists that came pouring in. All of them wanted to see the three things. One was the destruction of the Serbian army that was supposed to be there, the rape camps, and it was the uh, mass graves that they were all looking for. Of course, um, in their scramble to find that, they were overlooking stories, or, or in fact, manufacturing stories. This particular picture was taken um, the very day that the uh, NATO troops arrived. The main mosque in Pristina, uh, the journalists were setting up at the uh, Grand Hotel, and suddenly a huge pillar of smoke came from behind the main mosque. So everyone set up and started covering live how the Serbs had sent a final message to the Albanians by burning the main mosque, and they were filming it live here in Pristina. Myself and a Swedish guy walked up the hill and found out that the mosque wasn't on fire, the former Serbian brigade headquarters was, and it was the Albanians that had set it on fire. Of course, the NATO accredited journalists didn't think it necessary to change their story. It was also the story of all the Serbs that began fleeing in the wake of the revenge killings that were happening while the NATO troops were on the ground. People were fleeing in the hundreds of thousands, not the tens of thousands. And these were some of the families that were taking off. I actually left with the Serbs. I left with the refugees on the buses that we went through. And in Pristina at that time, there was gauntlets of Albanians, mobs of Albanians that would set up with NATO protection setting up the intersections and they would stone the vehicles and they would beat people and if they could use logs to stop the car they would pull them out and beat them in front of the NATO troops. The only time the NATO troops would intervene is if they were bringing the Serbs close to death. I remember getting back to Belgrade and telling that story to a CBC producer of what had happened, what I'd been through and he said well all those people on your bus were probably war criminals. But there's one of the passengers that was on my bus with me and he was petrified as we got attacked by the, by the Albanians. Other people, of course, fled with everything they had. Um, after NATO journalists and NATO had declared victory, and everyone said to them, the word is actually liberation, how you could liberate Kosovo from a state which was still recognized as its own sovereign territory was beyond me, but the journalists didn't care to question it. They all packed up. They came home. Never found the mass graves, never found the uh, rape camp, and certainly the terms of the destruction of the Serbian army in total, there was 13 tanks destroyed, and some of those were museum pieces that the Serbs kept putting out, so NATO would attack them again and again. <laughs> um, NATO journalists all took off, and of course, that didn't end the violence. Uh, there was incursions into South Serbia. I kept covering that. There was all the disruption inside the, the internal Serbian politics, the uh, removal of Milosevic, etc. Question is coming to power. Uh, Albanians then, under the same Utrika banner, moving into Macedonia. I mean, other journalists were covering this. They would give them fancy names like the Ona, the Hana, etc. But whenever you went into Macedonia, etc., all you ever saw painted on their bunkers was Uchika, and on their armbands was the same Uchika Kele armbands they always had. It wasn't until 2004, when everybody was watching Iraq, that another incident happened. Of course, the pogrom in, uh, on the uh, 17th of March in Kosovo, when they went ran rampant, and again, people began to question what the hell we had done. Why was this violence happening with 20,000 NATO troops there? Religious sites that were burnt, that was there. That was the uh, one outside of uh, what was that? prison. 
Um, they didn't just burn the religious sites, of course, they burned Serbian houses, I think 800 houses were burned, and of course they killed a number of Serbs as well. Something which couldn't be ignored, but it was a blip on the radar screen. Everybody managed to get the genie back in the bottle, up until this year when we had the Unilateral De Declaration of Independence, which prior to, everyone from the Albanian leadership was saying that they are very much uh, an inclusive society, that this is, you know, the things that happened in the past are to be forgotten. I mean, now it's uh, all Albanians and non-Albanians can live in harmony. Well, of course, the day that they declared independence, that was the Albanian media. Obviously a provocation to any non-Albanian, particularly the Serbs living inside the, the enclaves there. Uh, provoked a response, of course. The Serbs in Mitrovica went out and destroyed the customs point. We had more coverage of that than we did of anything else that was happening or any background events um, to that. And of course, that led to the events on this March 17th, which was in Mitrovica, it became sort of the battleground, that's the, the big enclave in the north where um, they had set up their own sort of puppet or shadow government, took over the city hall, I believe it was, uh, and then of course on the same date that was the anniversary of the previous pogrom, in came the NATO troops, which ended up in a big riot, which we saw coverage of in 63, um, in NATO security forces and police were were injured in that along with a number of Serbs that were killed, etc. So it became very much the focal point. Um, but then again, everyone else just sort of went back to sleep, and Canada quietly a month later agreed to recognize the independence of Kosovo, which brings us to the point of the honesty of the Albanians, who are about the only honest broker in this whole game. They've never stopped flying the flag of Albania over their houses when their celebrations. When you see it, you might see the odd of newly designed Kosovo flag, but for all this time they've been flying on all their, their main buildings, the flag of an independent neighboring country, even though they now claim to be their own. That's just one example there. Um, this is the TMK, this is the current Kosovo military uh, concern. That's the, on the left is much smaller and less prominent is the new Kosovo flag. They still know where their loyalty lies and are not afraid to display it. And of course, you've got a picture of Adam Yashari, who was a, a brigand and a thief, who was killed by Serbian security forces before there was even a notion of an Uchika or KLA, but he seem, seems to have become the uh, father figure of this new country. Again, provocation for any non-Albanians uh, inside uh, Kosovo. You've got this uh, Haradinaj, Ramush Haradinaj, showing clearly his uh, wartime uh, presence in his uniform, linked now to his much kinder, gentler look as a politician now um, in Albanian circles. He's also was just released from The Hague. He was being held in The Hague for war crimes. Uh, incredibly, all the witnesses that were going to testify to his crimes ended up dead. So that of the lack of evidence, he's now been released back into Pristina, but the fact is nobody within the UN police forces or circles knows or, or doesn't think for a second that he's not guilty of those crimes and guilty of having killed off the witnesses that were aligned against him. But again, as Joe McKenzie pointed out, this is the leadership that they're going to build a country on. This picture I love to show only for the fact that it's uh, Agim Ceku's house. You know, McKenzie mentioned him the crimes that he perpetrated in a Croatian uniform. Uh, members of our regiment were the ones who saw his, him in action. They wanted him indicted. Uh, he left his Croatian uniform behind, became the head of the KLA. We provided him with an Air Force. Uh, his people were behind the pogroms in uh, 2004. The house that he lives in is the one in the back. He's just taken out two Serbian houses. He's in Kosovo Polje now, living in a Serbian enclave and pushing out his Serbian neighbors. The houses that he's destroyed were destroyed first in the pogrom and he's now taken uh, control of them. But I just wanted to show that I, um, all these years of covering and, and opening up his past crimes and making sure that he gets an indictment in The Hague, I wasn't afraid to go to his house. He wasn't home, by the way. <laughs> Adam Yashari, as I mentioned, I mean, he is uh, redeemed and revered now in, uh, that's got to be an 80-foot poster. It's outside of the UN headquarters, which again, people inside the UN have proclaimed this to be uh, certainly a provocation or intimidation for any non-Albanian inside Kosovo. Um, there he is again. That's again. It's difficult to see the size of it, but that basically translates from Albanian to uh, "We will finish what he started." Essentially, and those pictures and posters are everywhere. And what he started was basically he was a thief and a, and a smuggler, but uh, he was gunned down. And apparently, according to the people that were there at the time, they found him in his dog kennel. He was hiding when they actually caught up with him and shot him. Bill Clinton again, honest. These people know who to thank. This is a uh, Bill Clinton Boulevard, I think it says, yeah. And again, look at the size of those windows, that tells you how big that poster is. They're not afraid to show who their makers are. And again, things like this, this is Agam Cechu's Hotel. 
once the Americans pull out, it'll be a 75-foot statue of himself holding a Kalashnikov, I'm sure. Who's happy in all this? Well, for now, the Albanians are happy, but again, they're, for the most part, 50% unemployed. Uh, Americans, of course, are happy. This chap was looking forward to his next uh, riot with the Serbs. In this picture I love to show because we already touched upon the fact that drugs and prostitution constitute the majority of the uh, economy illegitimately. The foreign aid is the bulk of, of the actual economy. And this, I was told, was a surprising statistic that junk metal um, from scrapyards, automobile scrapyards, is the major legitimate export from Kosovo. Now, how you're going to build a country on that, I don't know. But given the state of the roads, it's a growth increase, or growth of uh, independence. 17,000 NATO soldiers still patrol the streets, still there to provide security, and anytime you've got 17,000 foreign troops in something which is just a little bit larger than Prince Edward Island, you are not independent. And again, it's made clear, this is inside some of the Serbian enclaves, that NATO is watching and NATO is protecting them and watching their, their protests. The Serbian police were taken out of uh, the enclaves, replaced with Albanian police, and now you have to have NATO soldiers to protect the Albanian police inside the enclaves, but somehow that's considered to be independence. I'm going to push through some of this stuff because I know we're running for time. This is uh, in Gora. It's something which is just a little unique sort of side chapter. On our last trip, we went down to Gora. The Goranis are actually Serbs converted to Islam, uh, which throws in a big twist. They're still loyal to Serbia. They fought for the Serbs against the Albanians in the last war. And as such, of course, they're being persecuted by the Albanian, by their Albanian neighbors. But again, whenever you've got this simplified down into black and white, it's Orthodox Serb versus Muslim Albanians. In this case, no, you've got Albanians still intolerant of these uh, people who self-profess to be Serbs that happen to convert to Islam. Uh, some of the territory. That's actually the uh, only single Gorani member of parliament. It's kind of like a Borat thing. This is his house. Welcoming us to his house. But mountain people, uh, hearts of gold, very poor, and of course they're being preyed upon now and forced to leave. There's only about 8,000 of them left out of the original 20,000. Story you don't really hear. That's uh, rush hour in Dragas. That's what Borat did. Simple people. Um, that's the, the border between Kosovo and Albania. It's completely open. It's been completely open since 99. All the former checkpoints that were manned by the Serbian security forces um, have been abandoned. And that's something which a German soldier pointed out to me that this was. Uh, could easily be closed with one reconnaissance vehicle and a, and a company of troops, but for, since 1999, powers that be have chosen to leave that open. And now what's happening is they're not just coming in and bringing in their drugs or their, their weapons or whatever trade that they're doing. They're actually coming in and completely harvesting the woods, the forests on the sides of the mountains inside Kosovo proper, which of course takes away the, the, the land that the Goranis use and that the, they live in, taking away their habitat, if you will. And again, indicative that the people, the Albanians in Kosovo, see no difference in protecting their resources from people in Albania. They see it as one of the same and that this is in fact all just greater Albania. Uh, in Lipian, Lipian uh, after the pogrom in 2004, temporary headquarters were set up, uh, donated by the Russians, and uh, they're still living in them compared to the other aid that's being given to the Serbs. In other words, there's no um, initiative on the part of the international powers to make a life for the Serbs. They basically got nowhere to go. This particular guy had been flushed out of the uh, Kraina in Croatia, came to Kosovo to find a new life, and now lives in a container, and has been since April 2004. Um, going through, okay, these are the uh, this is outside of Mitrovica, it's on the Albanian side. These are, this was destroyed graveyards. They went in there. This happens all over Kosovo, wherever they can find. And not, not even in death will they let the Serbs rest in Kosovo. They've destroyed these graveyards, um, toppling the statues. This one was a little boy. He was eight years old. And he smashed his headstone too. So just to gives an indication. This one was a, uh, a newborn or a stillborn. And there was a little uh, fountain that had been in there. They tore that out, ripped it up. They also used the graveyard as a garbage dump, as an insult to the Serbs. Uh, and just to give you an example of when you just cross a kilometer away from there, there's another graveyard inside the Serbian enclave of Mitrovica, and it's pristine as you can imagine, just like that. Um, people want to leave on a hopeful note. All I can say is that uh, it's still evident that this is the religious heartland of Serbia. Uh, the ones that the buildings that remain, the people can't deny that this needs to be protected. These things don't just belong to the Serbs, they belong to everybody given their age. It's all part of our, uh, all of our histories. 
Uh, this is the monastery in Gracenitsa. And of course, there's Prince uh, Lazar's tower on the battlefield that, as you know, started it all. It's still there. Um, Serbian spirit inside Kosovo. I know this doesn't show very much, but it's still active. I mean, despite all the kicks they've taken, there's people living in the enclaves still go out and protest almost daily, still defiant, as is the flag that flies above uh, Mitrovica. And of course, it comes back down to the showdown, which is still expected. I mean, what happens in Mitrovica is going to determine what happens uh, in the rest of Kosovo. If the other en enclaves go one by one and Mitrovica stays, it's not going to change the situation. If they can manage to secure, as there is a a plan afoot, which we learned of, um, to try to subdue and secure that from the Serbs, that will mean the end of Serbian presence in Kosovo.